This past week, we planned that we were going to introduce our elders today. And then um, Jonathan texted me yesterday, he said, hey, did you remember to tell them? And I said, no, you know, I forgot to text them. And uh, so this morning we said, well, we're not going to wait. We're not going to do it today, but we are going to do it next week. However, all of our elders are here today. And uh, some of them have said they won't be here next week. So I'm going to ask all of our elders, if you would, to come on to the stage. And uh, we're going to have a prayer of dedication. We're going to introduce them. And uh, I realize that we kind of, uh, that's kind of a, an audible call on my part. And our tech team, the wonderful people that plan and do all this, I probably just threw them for a loop. But if we don't have the names up on the screen, that's fine. But I want to introduce um, our elders to you today. And we're going to have a prayer of dedication. And uh, we love these men. They have been so faithful here at our church. Uh, do we have the, the slide with their names or did we delete that? Delete it? Okay. All right. Well, I don't know their names, so I'm not going to tell it anyway. But uh, no, I'm just kidding. I, so you like, you, you ought to learn a long time ago not to take me very seriously. All right. So, um, but, uh, and some of you don't listen to what I say anyway. So we're good. All right. So, uh, but these men, uh, God has uh, brought them to us. They've been faithful over the years in our church. And um, I just want you to know them and love them and pray for them. And uh, I believe that God uh, is using each one of them, has already used them in the past. And, um, you know, some of, our, some of our men here have been here longer than others. Neil, for example, uh, Neil Gardner, uh, started going to Avalon before Avalon even existed. He was a part of the team, he and Bonnie, uh, that were part of the team that uh, launched the church. And uh, Ken, I've told you about Ken Roberts, that basically uh, Ken visited, his kids had started coming here. And uh, back then we did uh, what was called Dinner with the Pastor. That was kind of our membership class. We did it at our house. And um, sometimes you misread people. Because when he came to our church, he and his wife, Dawn, uh, I told Kim after the evening was over, I said, well, those people will never be back at our church. And he's just an elder now. So uh, I couldn't have been more wrong. And uh, Will Thompson has uh, been coming to our church for several years now. And uh, God just used him uh, in my own life to be a great encouragement to me, his faithfulness and how he's been a blessing, uh, not just to me, but to our church as well. And it's just been a blessing to see uh, all that. And Larry Potter, not Harry Potter, but Larry Potter. Uh, I wish that he got in on some of the money from Harry Potter because this man tithes and we would build a beautiful, beautiful building and not worry about it. But, but Larry actually has been uh, here for several years as well and been a real blessing uh, to our church and his faithfulness. And uh, Brian Duvall uh, has been uh, faithful. Brian, how many years have you and Melody been coming now? Melody's not up here to help me, but I think it's 15. About 15 years. And just about the entire time we've been in this uh, building here. And then Matt Miller, of course, uh, he and his family have been coming uh, for a long time. Now, not all the wives are here, but if you are uh, here, the wives of our elders, would you stand? Would you stand? Uh, Several of them here, some of them serving. Some, let's give these ladies a hand as well. And God bless you guys for your faithfulness. Thank you so much. Now, uh, our elders are uh, spiritual leaders in our church. They're also our board. Uh, so any kind of legal decision that we make, uh, this is the team that makes it. And so, uh, but anyway, I hope you'll pray for these men. Pray that God will use them, bless them, keep them close to him. And um, I know that uh, if you have a question or a problem, you can seek these men out and they will do their best to help you as well. What I'd like to do at this time is have a prayer of dedication and uh, pray that God will use these men over the next year and a half as they serve. Uh, and, and let me just say this, uh, we do allow our elders to rotate off from time to time, but they don't have to, all right? So uh, sometimes they're gonna serve for a longer period of time. Sometimes they'll take a break. They're still an elder. They're just gonna go inactive for a bit. But um, so anyway, you pray for these men uh, that God would use them and bless them in a great way. Let's pray together. Father. Thank you for these men and their wives and their families and how they've ministered to you and to God's people here at Avalon Church. Thank you so much for their faithfulness. 
Thank you so much for how they serve. Thank you so much for their attitude. Thank you so much for their spiritual leadership in our church. And God, I pray that you just bless them in a mighty, mighty way. I pray that you'd use them. I pray that you'd keep them close to you. And Father, I pray that this next year and a half will be a tremendous time in the history of our church as they serve your people here at Avalon Church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's give them a hand as they go off stage. God bless you guys. You can go ahead uh, and be seated. Thank you so much uh, for being here with us today. Well, you're going to see some pictures on the screen, and it's going to depict an event that happened when I was about 10 years old. What you're looking at is a bridge that collapsed uh, where I grew up. I grew up in North Carolina, and this is the same county where I grew up called Surrey County, North Carolina. On February the 23rd, 1975, the Siloam Bridge collapsed. It collapsed. There was a, a storm that happened. My mom and dad still live there. In fact, just a few miles from uh, where this bridge and it's been replaced since then. But just a few miles from where this bridge is, you can see that this bridge collapsed. And initially when it happened, no one knew. In fact, for a good period of time, there were people that were driving along this road and they would come up over the, the ramp that comes up to the bridge, and they were not aware because it was a foggy, rainy night, and they were not aware that the bridge was out, and they would drive off the edge and into the river. And this happened for quite some time. There was a man and his wife. His name was Hugh Atkinson. They heard screams. They had no idea what it was, but because they were servants to their community, because they loved others, they jumped in their car, both of them, and they sped out. They thought that something was happening on the other side of the river, and as they sped up that ramp, they did not realize that the bridge was out, and they drove over the edge of the bridge to their death. In 1938, Hugh Atkinson was instrumental and getting this bridge put in. Before then, there was no bridge. It was a ferry that took people across the river. And in, 19, in the early 1970s, he began to write to the governor of North Carolina and to other state officials, whoever they would tell him to write to, because after so many years, that bridge had become unsafe. And Hugh knew that that bridge was going to collapse eventually. And he told the governor, and he told uh, officials, he told county commissioners, he told all kinds of people that would listen to him. He wrote to them, and he warned them. He said, this bridge is unsafe. Please replace it. And letter after letter after letter, he wrote. And on that night, the bridge collapsed. There were four people killed that night. Thirteen others were injured. Finally, there was a man that was driving a little slower. He knew something was wrong. He couldn't tell what it was, but he knew something was wrong. And as he drove up to the bridge, he slowed down, fortunately, and he was able to stop before he drove off into the water. He jumped out of his car, turned on his emergency flashers, and he began to do everything that he could to keep people from driving off the bridge. He turned his car sideways where people could not go across the bridge and he uh, got out with his flashlight and he began to warn people and finally he got someone uh, to be able to call to someone to the other side of the river and they too went over and blocked so that people could not drive over. I'll never forget it. I mean, I was actually there that night. The incredible thing was that as we look back on that, Hugh Atkinson warned people. He begged the governor to no avail. His grandson actually became later uh, the sheriff of that county. And the story, everyone there still knows the story, very familiar with it till this day. 
But I've often wondered, what would have happened? If the man that parked his car sideways so no one else could drive over the bridge, off the bridge into the water, I wonder what would happen if he had said, you know what, none of my business, I'm just going to go on home. What if he had said, you know what, let somebody else do it because, you know, I'm kind of busy, I don't have time. What if he had made an excuse and not got involved? Well, I know this, that if he had not gotten involved, more people would have died. More people would have driven over that bridge to their death. And I often wonder, what is it going to be like in heaven? I mean, the truth is, there are many Christians, unfortunately, that they don't recognize or realize that, metaphorically speaking, people are driving off the bridge into eternity. And they're driving over the bridge to disaster. Some are driving over that bridge to disaster in their marriage. Others are driving over that bridge to disaster with their kids. Some are driving over that bridge and literally driving into eternity without Christ. And I do know this, that God has called us. If you're a believer by us, I mean you're a Christian, you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and and maybe you don't have a car that you can block the bridge, but maybe what you've got is a light, and you can flash that light, and you can warn others. I do know this. There are people literally every day of our lives that are driving off the bridge. The question I have for us today is, do we make excuses? Which of us online watching, which of us in the room today says, ah, you know, I'm too busy. I would warn people from going over the bridge to their eternal doom, but you know what? I'm not really thinking about it because I'm, I'm busy. One of these days, I'm going to get around to it. One of these days, when I get more time, one of these days, when things slow down at work, one of these days, when I retire, one of these days, when the kids grow up, one of these days, when golf season is over, one of these days, when hunting season is over, one of these days, I'm going to get involved. I plan on it. I don't believe any Christian would ever say, you know what, let people drive off the bridge to their death. I don't think any Christian would ever do that. No serious person would ever want to do that. No person that loves Jesus would ever do that. But you know what we do oftentimes? We get lulled to sleep. And we forget that there's more to this life than our job. We forget that there's more to this life than the latest show that we want to binge watch. We forget that there's more to this life than our hobbies. We forget that there's more to this life than our vacations. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting any of those things are wrong. They're not. And I hope you do enjoy time off, and I hope you do have a schedule that you have margin in because that's what God wants for your life. But make no mistake about it, friend. There are people driving off the bridge There are people that are dying and going to hell. And it is our job not to make an excuse and say, I'm too busy. I'll do it later. Somebody else can do that because God has called us to serve him. I realize that's kind of a dramatic story, but I wanted to use it to set up what I want to talk to you about today. And here's what I want to talk to you about. God wants to use you. God wants to use you. Now, because not every person has every gift, because not every person has every talent, God has called us to be a part of a team. He's called us to be a part of a family. He's called us to be a part of a flock, if you will, a part of the church. And the beauty of the church, as God has designed it, is that everybody gets to be on the team. Do you remember what it was like when you were a kid? Maybe you weren't this way. Maybe it was just me. But do you remember what it was like when you were a kid? And maybe the older kids, they wanted to have a game and you didn't get chosen. Anybody ever remember that? 
I can remember being so insanely jealous when I was in second or third grade. I wanted to play with the boys that were older than me, and sometimes they wouldn't let me. Sometimes they wouldn't choose me for their team because I wasn't old enough or big enough or fast enough or good enough or whatever. But the good news about being a part of God's team, the good news about being a part of the church is that everybody gets chosen because you have something valuable to add. You have a gift. You have a talent. You have an ability that the rest of God's people need. And just like the man that warned people from going over the bridge into the water, God wants to use you and me to tell others about Jesus. He wants to use you and me to be the, warn, the warning sign, the people that warn others from going over to their doom. He wants us to be the ones that point people to him. And you get to be a part of that. You have been called to do that. You said, well, I'm kind of busy. Well, we all have the same amount of time. It's just what we choose to do with our time. And, and look, I get that there are seasons to life, and I, I understand that. Sometimes you can't help your work schedule. I get that. But make no mistake about it. God has equipped you. God has talented you. And God has given you the opportunity to serve him. Now, not everybody has the same schedule, but we all have 24 hours in a day. Not everybody has the same gifting, but we all have something to contribute. And so today, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about this thought. God wants to use you. I want to read today from Romans chapter 10, just a few verses, Romans 10, 13 through 15. And here's what it says. The apostle Paul penned this a very long time ago. He said, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I would have thought that when I read that, there would be a little bit more excitement about it because that includes you. Let me read it again. Let it sink in. For everyone, not some, not the rich, not the good, not the moral, not the talented, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Can I get an amen right there? Thank God. But then I want you to notice what Paul writes. This is very important. He said, he throws this out there that there are people that need to be saved and everyone who calls on him will be. But then he gives us this challenge. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? It's a serious question. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? If they never hear of Jesus, how can they call on the name of Jesus? If they don't know who he is, if no one has told them that they can believe in him, how are they going to believe in him? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? I want you to say that word with me. Ready? Preaching. All right? Don't be afraid to say the word. I'm not going to call you up here to preach. All right? So some of you are like, if I say that word, he's going to make me come up on that stage and preach. No, I'm not. Because I'm going to explain what that word means in just a minute. Everybody say that word preaching. Ready? One, two, three. Preaching. I'm going to tell you what it means. It doesn't mean what you think it means. Okay, it doesn't mean to stand up on the stage and do what I'm doing right now. How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So God calls people. And as it is, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Beautiful feet. I don't know about you. But I want to be a part of the Beautiful Feet Club. Now, if you've ever seen my, sh my feet, seen me without my shoes on, you would not say Richie has beautiful feet. And let, let me just let you know, maybe some of you think that feet are beautiful, and they have a word to describe people like that. Weirdo. All right? That's, that's the scientific term. All right? Uh, I know some people like feet better than others. I think feet are wonderful. They take you places. You can stand up. You can use them. Uh, sometimes you can even kick a ball with them, you know. But most people aren't going to say that feet are beautiful. Feet are sometimes gnarly. You ever seen gnarly feet? You know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all are talking about, yeah, it's your feet. You know, don't, don't be pointing, all right. Uh, sometimes feet smell, you know. 
wear shoes all day. Uh, when I was 17 years old, uh, took a missions trip down to Mexico. We went up in the central Mexico, up in the mountains. And I was um, up there in the mountains for about three or four days. And we did not take a shower the entire time. When I got back down to where we were staying in Durango, Mexico, I took my shoes off to go take a shower. And when I took my shoes off, they just got up and walked out of the room. All right, they were so nasty and gnarly. They just walked out of the room on them uh, by their own power. All right, I'm just kidding about that. But the fact is, sometimes feet smell. Sometimes feet have bunions on them. Sometimes, you ever seen this? You ever seen a person that has the corn chip toenails? You know what I'm talking about? I don't know if it's like a fungus or I'm not sure what that is. But some of you, you have such corn chip toenails that you have to cut your toenails with a lawnmower. I mean, it is, that is how bad and how gnarly and how ugly they are. Now, I love it. My wife, she likes to paint her toenails and I think it looks cute and all. But I just don't really think that feet are that beautiful, to be honest with you. They're important. But aren't you glad that God takes the parts of us that no one thinks are that beautiful? They're not going to be the things that we put out front. They're not going to be the things that we think of first when we think of beauty. Aren't you glad that God redeems even the ugly parts of us, even the worst parts of us, even the parts of us that nobody thinks that highly of? I sure am glad that God does that. He says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel. Don't think of the word preach as referring to a preacher bringing a sermon because it's not talking about pastors. The word preach here simply means this, to declare the good news. That's all it means, to tell somebody that God loves them, to tell somebody about the gospel, to tell somebody about the life-changing power of Jesus, to tell somebody what God has done in your life. You're working with someone, they're going through a difficult time in their marriage, and you're able to say, you know what, man, I didn't know Jesus, but I started going down to this church called Avalon Church, and God began to work in my life and my wife's life, and God rescued our marriage. I'm telling somebody about some good news. My life was headed toward the rocks. I was addicted. I I was an alcoholic. I was on drugs. I was addicted to all kinds of things I should not be addicted to. But I went down to this church, and the preacher down there told me that God loved me, that Jesus died for me. And I want you to know that today I have hope, and everything has changed in my life. Somebody needs to declare the good news of Jesus. And God says when you do that, that you are a part of the Beautiful Feet Club. Isn't that cool? A part of the Beautiful Feet Club. Now, I really do believe this. When we serve, we are declaring the good news. Now, there are all kinds of things in the church that work together to declare the good news. When you give, you're having a part of that. When you worship and attend, you're having a part of that. But especially if you serve, you're having a huge part of this because the church cannot function without people serving. It just simply can't. It's impossible. It won't function the way God intended for it to function. It cannot just be declared by the pastor and the staff or the elders, but it's got to be declared. The good news, the beautiful feet club has got to include everybody in the church. And when I declare the good news by serving, I make a difference. Thus, the title of the message, God wants to use you. God wants to use you. Now, let me just give you three thoughts from this text before I get into the main part of the message. Now, I realize I've already been going for a little bit, and some of you are like, oh my goodness, is he not going to get us out in time? Yes, I am. Uh, Because the message part is short, all right? The setup is really long, all right? So I'm setting this up. But I want you to see what this text says. It says that every person who asks will be saved. That's important to know. Because just like the man that was blocking people from driving over the Siloam Bridge to their death, every person that asks, every person that 
someone shares Jesus with them, he tell, someone tells them about the good news of God's love for them, about how Jesus uh, died on the cross, if they tell, someone tells them about the gospel, every person that's willing to accept that, not a single person that asks God will be rejected. You're not too bad. It's not too late. You have not gone too far. If today, online, you're watching this and you need hope and you need some good news, the good news is that God says, if you will call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. He doesn't reject anybody. He doesn't require that you change your behavior. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that because for a lot of years, I was taught bad theology about what the word repent means. The word repent does not mean to change your behavior. That may become as a shock to a lot of you because I was always told that. You want to repent, you got to quit doing what you do and start doing this. That is not what the word repent means. You know what the word repent means? It means to change your mind, not your behavior, to change your mind, to begin to think the way God thinks, to agree with God. That's what the word repent means. And you know what happens when you begin to agree with God? When you say, yes, I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. Yes, I'm going to trust him by faith. God is the one that begins to change your behavior. And when God changes your behavior, it stays changed. It stays changed. You know what? I've changed, I've tried to change my behavior from time to time. I've tried to change the way I act from time to time. But I can tell you this, until I change the way I think, it never lasts. Not ever. Not ever. But when I repent, I begin to change my thinking. I begin to agree with God. I change the way I think about God. Then God is the one that changes my behavior. And that's where real lasting change comes from. Number one, every person who asks will be saved. Number two, no one gets saved unless someone declares good news. Did you know that um, unless somebody tells you about Jesus, you're not going to know what to do with Jesus? If all you've ever heard about Jesus is his name being used as a swear word, then you don't know what the gospel is about. But when someone tells you the gospel, the beauty of the fact that, yes, you're born a sinner, and yes, you have no ability to be good enough to earn your way into a right relationship with God, but Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He, as the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity from eternity past, became human, died on a cross for our sins, and defeated death, and conquered sin, and was buried in a real grave, and three days later got up out of that grave and conquered sin and death and hell for us then when I call on him it's not my behavior that saves me it's not my church attendance that saves me it's not my giving that saves me or my generosity that saves me it's Jesus that saves me and so no one gets saved unless someone declares the good news and then number three is this those who declare the good news are incredibly blessed incredibly blessed I I wish I had time to tell you so many stories but here's what I know there are people that have served and are serving in our children's ministry and yes sometimes it can be a challenge but oh what an incredible blessing let me tell you this every mother every father that's been involved with your kids in little league baseball or in dance class or in cheerleading. I had one member of our church that started her daughter in cheerleading when she was five years old, all the way through her senior year of high school. And she said, I'm hoping that she'll win a scholarship so we won't have to pay for college. I said, how much money do you spend every year on cheerleading? She said, oh, between five and $10,000. I said, you could have sent your kid to Harvard uh, with all the money you spent on that cheerleading competition. I'm not against cheerleading, okay? If that's what you want with your kids, that's great. But for every parent that's gotten involved in Little League football, or soccer, or dance, let me tell you something. You're qualified to make a difference in the lives of children. You say, well, I'm not a teacher. Yes, you are. Oh, you may not be the one that stands up in front of the class, but you're teaching with your life. You're teaching with your example, and God will use you if you'll just say yes. That's all you got to do. Say yes. God will use you in youth ministry. I was thinking about this this week. We have people today, in fact, people that were on this stage today, 
people that are on our staff today. Do you know why? Yes, because of God's grace, but because years ago, when we started this church 20 years ago, there were people that were investing in the lives of teenagers, and today there are people on our staff that are part of that team because of you. There are people that are on this stage today playing musical instruments that are serving God because somebody said, I'm going to work in youth ministry. Somebody said, I'm going to love teenagers. Somebody said, I'm going to have beautiful feet, and I'm going to make a difference. You have no clue what it's going to be like when you stand before God, when you serve. The people that you've influenced, I've told you this story before. There was a man here several years ago that came, and he was on his last leg. In fact, he woke up that morning, and he made this decision. He said, I'm going to give God one last chance. Now, what he was saying was he was at the end of his rope. And he said, if I don't find something today... I'm going to commit suicide. And his plan was two things. He was going to find a church somewhere randomly and go into it and see if God spoke to him. And if he didn't feel like God did, he was going to go home and kill himself. That was how low and depressed he was. And that man walked into this building on the other side of that wall. One of our guest services, team members, She met him. She said, it was so good to see you today. She smiled at him. She welcomed him. She even hugged his neck. And that man that day got saved. And he did not go home and commit suicide. But he began to go to this church. He's since moved to another uh, part of the country. But thank God there was somebody here that said, I'm going to have some beautiful feet today. And they made a difference. You see... You may think that what you do doesn't matter. You may think that being a a greeter or serving in guest services or working in the tech team or working in the kids or the youth or whatever it is, you may think that that doesn't make that big of a difference, but you could not be more wrong. God wants to use you. Let, Let me give you just, here's the message, all right? Do it in just a few minutes. Just some thoughts about being a part of that beautiful feet club, the one that God uses. Here's number one, volunteers are heroes. When you serve, when you serve God in the church, you're a hero. You say, where do you get that from? Daniel chapter 12, verse three, those who are wise will shine as bright as the sky and those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. You want your star to shine forever? Just be a part of that beautiful feet club. Be a part of serving God in the local church. Number two, volunteers fulfill their purpose. Did you know that God has a purpose for your life? And you're never going to find that purpose as long as everything in your life is about you. But when you start coming to church, not for yourself, not for what you get out of it, but for what you can do for somebody else, you begin to discover your purpose. God begins to give you joy. God begins to use you, and it makes a difference in your life and in the lives of others. 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God says you've got a responsibility to just steward his grace in your life. And there's not a person in here that can say, God hasn't given me any grace. Oh, he has. He's poured out so much grace on your life and on my life. And God says we need to be stewards of that so that others will see Jesus and will preach the good news to them. Number three, volunteers receive a reward. Listen to this. Mark 9, 41, for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Do you get that? Something as simple as serving a cup of water in the name of Jesus will get a reward. God blesses you when you do it. It's important that we see the importance of that. Number four, God blesses those who obey By serving. Make no mistake about it, it is a command. It is a call of God. You say, well, do we have options? Well, yeah, you have the option not to do it. That's you certainly have that option. But not if you're going to be in right relationship with God, not if you're going to serve Him. We have the responsibility to obey. And God 
blesses us when we obey. Listen to some scriptures. Proverbs 16, 20, God blesses those who obey him. Can't get any simpler than that, can you? God blesses those who obey him. Psalm 37, 18, the Lord takes care of those who obey him. How many would like to be taken care of by God? I, I know I do. I mean, look, I can't imagine anybody that's better at taking care of you than God is. He says, when you obey him, he takes care of you. Proverbs 28, 14, always obey the Lord and you will be happy. Let that sink in for a minute. You want to be happy? The key to happiness is not more money. Nothing wrong with more money. More money can pay for the pursuit of happiness, but it's not going to buy you one second of happiness. But God says, when you obey him, you'll be happy. You'll be happy. Proverbs 19, 16, keep God's laws and you will live longer. You want a longer life? You want a more fruitful life? Serve him. Psalm 34, 10, those who obey the Lord lack nothing good. Do you get that? Lack nothing good. Man, I want that. Psalm 34, 9, those who obey him have all they need. You ever just get to the point in life where you're satisfied? We had our staff over to our house on Friday and they brought sides, and we got some steak. In fact, I bought these ribeye steaks, and um, I was so proud of that. You ever have one of those moments where you're like, man, this is going to be awesome. I'm going to knock it out of the park. It's going to be so good. They're going to be so proud of me. They're going to be telling me, oh, we love those steaks. They were so awesome. You're such an awesome steak cooker, Richie, you know. And I don't know what I did. I spent a lot of money on them. I know that. Uh, but somehow or another, I, I screwed them up. I don't know what I did. I, I really don't know what I did. Uh, but some of them were tender, but some of them were so tough, I could have put them on and wore them as shoes. And they would have lasted longer than any shoes that I, I have some shoes in my closet that are 20 years old. I promise you, if I put those stakes on my feet, 20 years from now, they still be on my feet. I screwed it up. I don't know what I did wrong, but I do know this. Um, well, I forgot the point that I was actually trying to make right there, to be honest with you. I got so distracted by that terrible meat. It was delicious, but it was tough. I was trying to chew through it. Uh, I don't know. The point is, I guess, that uh, you, you got to let uh, God use you in whatever way. I don't know what the point of that story was, to be honest with you. I really, really don't. I'm just being honest, okay? I'm just being honest. Aren't you glad you've got an honest pastor, okay? Because I could have made some kind of BS application that you're like, oh, man, that was so deep. I have no idea what he was talking about, but that was deep. I must have really, really missed that. No, I just screwed it up. All right, so I just screwed it up. That's all it was. Let me, let me tell you this. You should obey God immediately. Psalm 119, verse 32, I will quickly obey your commandments. Without delay, I hurry to obey your commands. You ever have kids, those of you who have kids, you know that kids can, pl can play the delayed obedience game. Anybody, you know what I'm talking about, right? Hey, uh, come to dinner, come to supper. And they play deaf. Oh, I, I didn't hear you. Who were you calling? Oh, I was calling the neighbor's kids, you know, like I normally do. Of course I was calling you, you idiot. Get in here. Quit playing the delayed obedience game. The second game they play is that imagine that mom is talking to somebody else. Oh, you wanted me to come to supper. Oh, you want me to respond. Oh, you want me to clean my room. I thought you were talking to the brother. I didn't realize you were talking to me. Did you know that we play that game often with God in our lives? Delayed obedience. Oh, I'm going to get around to it one day. But we don't. Oh, God, you were talking to me. <laughs> Oh, you, you mean, you want me to, oh, you want me to be a part of the, oh, you want me to do that. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you're talking to me. Well, of course he is. We need to obey immediately. And then I should obey God completely. One of the oldest tricks of the devil is that he gets us to participate in partial obedience. Oh, we're going to do a little bit of what he said. Not all of it, but a little bit. A little bit. Satan played that game in the Garden of Eden with Eve. 
And then I should obey God happily. Psalm 100, verse 2, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve him with gladness. You know, some of you, you're Christians. You just need to let your face know it because you look angry or sad all the time. You act like there's nothing good going on in life. And the fact is, everything that God does in our life and everything he's planned for us in our future is good. Let your face know about it. Let your face know about it. Serve the Lord with gladness. Psalm 119, verse 16, I enjoy obeying your commands. (laughs) I get so tickled at some Christians. They act as if serving God or living for him is like the worst punishment in the world. And and part of that's being brought up in a legalistic background, you know. You don't think you can do anything fun, you know. Well, I guess I'll go to church. You know, I'd like to be out there playing golf today, but I'll go to church instead. Well, I, I, I guess I'll... I'll stay sober, all right? I mean, I don't want to, but, uh, you know, uh, I guess I will. And if you grew up in the church I did, you can't go dancing, right? So I don't know what that has to do with with godliness, but we evidently it did because we couldn't dance. I guess we were, if we started shaking too much, the devil got in us. I don't know what happened, but. (laughs) Serve the Lord with gladness. It is a pleasure to serve God. It is the best life possible. David said, I enjoy living for you. By the way, make sure you don't let the devil deceive you about your past. You remember the story of the Israelites after they had been enslaved in Egypt for a really long time and and God sent the 10 plagues, he raised up Moses and the plagues and all this stuff and finally they got out of Egypt And they didn't get very far at all. In fact, it wasn't even about a day. I mean, they literally had seen God do all these miracles. And a day later, Pharaoh's army starts chasing them. They've got mountains on both sides. Pharaoh's behind them. The Red Sea's in front of them. You know what they said? We need to go back into slavery. You remember what it was like back there? You know, they were misremembering. They were slaves, for goodness sake. Nobody wants to go back into that. But you know what happens to us often? Is we remember things differently than they really were. Oh, you remember back when uh, we used to do this when we were young and we uh, go to these parties and do all this stuff? And, And what you forget is the pain and the destruction and the hangovers. And all those things that ruin your relationships and ruin your friendships, you don't remember that. And and so don't be guilty of remembering your past in a way that it should not be remembered. Uh, He said, how I delight in your commandments, how I love them. And then finally, I should obey God constantly. Be happy about it. Serve him. Obey immediately. But... Do it constantly. In other words, consistently. That's what we're talking about, consistently. Life is not a 50-yard dash. You ought to be glad for that. Life is a marathon. And it's not so much how you start that matters. A good start's important, but it's not, it's not fatal if you don't get a good start. Some of you, you didn't get saved until you were adults. And that's okay. It's not fatal doesn't really matter so much how you start. What matters is how you finish. What matters is you cross the finish line. That's what God wants for your life. Psalm 119, verse 112, I have decided to obey your laws until the day that I die. I don't know about you, but I want that to be my verse. I'm going to serve God Till the day I die. I may not be the pastor of this church until the day I die. My goal is, just so you know, I'm not trying to be morbid, but my goal is still to be the pastor and working on a sermon or doing something around the office when I drop dead. That's my goal. I don't want to die in an old age home. I don't want the highlight of my life to be going uh, to Golden Corral during the week. I, 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 don't, I don't want to live life that long. You know when I want to live? 
until I'm going to live so that I can serve God till the day I die. That's my goal. That's my goal. And, and that should be your goal. You may not work at your job until the day you die. <laughs> you might say, yeah, that job's killing me now. <laughs> but I want to be like David. I want to serve God till the day that I die. And that's what God wants to do with your life. He's calling people to step up and to serve him. He's calling, let me be more specific. I say God's calling people, and you, yeah, he's calling those over there and those over there and those in the back of the room, those watching online. Let, let, let me be a little more specific. He's calling you. Don't let that slip past you. He's calling you. And I hope for your sake, for your happiness, for your joy, for your blessing, I hope that you serve God till the day that you die. Heavenly Father, let that be true of all of us. God, give us some faithful people that are just going to serve you till the day they die. God, help us to give our whole heart, all of our commitment to you. And God, I know that if we do, you'll use us in ways that we never thought possible. That when we stand before you, that we're going to see the blessing, the reward, the people, and it's going to be a blessing. Oh, God, we want you to know that we love you today. In Jesus' name, before I finish my prayer, I wonder if there's someone that would say, today, I want to call in the name of Jesus to be saved. I talked about that earlier in the message. Maybe today's your day. Maybe you're in the room. Maybe you're online. But call on Jesus today to be saved. You say, well, uh, I don't know what to say. Well, I can help you. Say something like this. It's not a little magical prayer, but it's from your heart. Dear Jesus, I believe you died for my sins and rose from the grave. And I'm calling on you right now to save me. Do you know if you just say something as simple as that, that God promises that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And today, if you did that online, please click that button at the bottom of the page there to let us know that you received Christ. If you did that today or want to do that in the room today, please fill out the next step card. Put on there that you pray to receive Christ today. And then I wonder how many would say, Pastor, you know, to be honest, this message spoke to me today, and I want to be a part of the Beautiful Feet Club. I want to be one of those that makes a difference. I want to serve God with my life. I want to do something for him. I want to do something that matters. If that's your prayer today, would you just lift your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it to pray for you? I see a lot of people. They're raising their hands. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Heavenly Father, help us to be a part of the Beautiful Feet Club and to declare the good news of Jesus to others through our service, through how we bring our gifts and our talents to the table. And we'll thank you and praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we dismiss today, let me remind you, number one, uh, if you want to take a next step, we are having baptism next Sunday. If you'd like to be baptized, fill out the next step card there. Uh, sign up to go to the next step class. It's going to be at the end of next month. Uh, you can be a part of that. If you'd like to be a part of a team in serving, I want to tell you how to do that in just a minute. Uh, if you want to be a part of a small group, uh, you can ask someone that has a lanyard on. They'll help you with that. Uh, but we really want you to take your next step already talked to you about filling out the next step card. If you're new to Avalon, please fill out one of those before you leave today. Uh, then let me end with this. Next Sunday, next Sunday, we're going to do something that we've not done before. We're calling it Avalon Backstage. And you may have noticed that I just spoke about serving, serving God. And so for those of you that are already serving faithfully, this is not for you. If you're already like on the worship team or serving in the back and you're serving every Sunday or uh, many Sundays out of the month or whatever, we're not asking you to sign up. This is not for you. But there is a card on the seat that you may have seen. And this is for people that are not currently serving. doesn't mean you've never served, but means that maybe currently you're not doing anything uh, or that you're under serving. You say, what does that mean? In other words, 
I'll just use this as an example. Uh, maybe you like to work at Hope events. Those are awesome. Wonderful. We're so glad for the people that serve. But they're only a couple times a year. And if you're serving at a Hope event a couple times a year, let's be honest, you ain't stressing yourself out too much. Okay? And I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm very appreciative of your service. I'm just saying maybe that's underserving. Maybe you got a little more to give. Maybe you got a little more you can bring to the table. And so if you're not serving very often, once every six weeks, once a month, whatever it is, then um, this is for you. And this is for those that are not currently serving. So what I want you to do is take this card. Next Sunday, here's all you got to do. Show up at 9 o'clock in the lobby. That's easy to remember. 9 o'clock in the lobby. And what we're going to do, the backstage pass basically is going to, uh, they're going to let you go to some of the meetings for the different uh, uh, ministries. They're going to let you, they're going to take you around and let you see the children's environment, the youth environment, uh, the worship team as they're getting ready, uh, guest services. They're going to let you, they're going to kind of take you around so that you can kind of get a taste of everything that is available for you to do here at the church. And by doing that, what might happen is you might say, oh, I didn't realize I, I'm interested in that ministry or I could do that. And so we're going to let you be a part of that uh, wherever it fits you best. So here's what I need you to do. Two things. One, fill out the card. I want everybody to grab one of those cards that's sitting on the seat next to you or maybe you're sitting on it. Reach under and get, grab it. Grab the card. I ain't dismissing until you get the card, all right? So just, there we go. Some of you are like, yes, I've got it. Please show it. Let me show it. All right, show it, show it, show it. There you go. Fill out the card, and then you can turn it in to one of the buckets on the way out. We've got people at both doors. They're going to have a red bucket, and you can turn it in there, and that way we'll get in contact with you, make sure you understand everything. And then just be here next Sunday at 9 o'clock in the lobby. Where are we going to be next Sunday? In the lobby. Where are we going to be next Sunday? In the lobby. Where are we going to be next Sunday? In the lobby. What time is it going to be? Nine o'clock. What time is it going to be? Nine o'clock. All right. There we go. Good deal. I should have asked how many are going to give the pastor a gift after the service today, and you would have said no. All right. You would have said no. So, uh, of course, I'm teasing about that. But um, the uh, so take that, fill it out, and I think um, I know it'll be a blessing. So this is for any of you that are interested in being a part of the Beautiful Feet Club. I want everybody to stand together. Since really the people that are doing this right now, there are a lot of people that have done it today already, but there's people in the tech booth, there are uh, people, uh, guest services at the door. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody turn around and face the people in the tech booth. Everybody turn around. Look at the people in tech. People in the tech booth, wave your hand where they can see you. All right, on three, I want you to say, y'all got beautiful feet. Ready? One, two, three. Y'all got beautiful feet. God bless you. Be a part of the Beautiful Feet Club this week. We'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.